Good afternoon. Shortly, we will hear an interesting lecture by Professor Steve Lipson on optical super microscopy. This is part of webinar series organized by Photonics Israel on various aspects of photonics. Photonics Israel operates within Engineer Association as a cluster of photonics entities. Since we start operating last year, we have established close relationships with similar clusters in the US and Europe. Our mission is to deepen the knowledge in this area and to encourage cooperation both within Israel and with photonics entities in the world. We are open to your suggestions and would love to help foster new local and international collaborations. My name is Shlomo Glazer. I am the manager of Photonics Israel. Steve Lipson is Emeritus Professor of Physics in the Technion. Professor Lipson work include super resolution microscopy, optical investigation of surface roughening in helium crystals at low temperatures, atmospheric transmission of infrared radiation, adaptive optics for astrono astronomical telescopes, and the dynamics of evaporation of thin films. Professor Lipson, the state is yours. Thank you. So can we see the, uh, the, the presentation, please? Yes. yes, okay. So good afternoon, everybody, if it is afternoon. And um, I'm going to take you on a tour of the topic of super resolution um, in microscopy. Super resolution also exists in other fields of uh, optics, but we we'll limit ourselves today to microscopy. Now, of course, this subject began with Ernst Abba in 1870, approximately, and uh, it, and um, he gave us he gave a limit to the resolution of a microscope, which lasted for approximately 100 years. A hundred years later, people started started asking seriously whether it was possible to do better. Why was it important? Because microscopists wanted to see things particularly in biology, and they couldn't, and, and they wanted to see them on the scale of molecules, which were, were which could possibly be, be observed if the wavelength was shorter, say in an electron microscope, but the electron microscope, of course, kills the specimen, and it'd be nice to be able to see things live. So the question came up, could it be, was it possible to exceed the ABBA limit? What I'll do in this talk is, first of all, remind you of what the ABBA limit is, or the limit of resolution in several optical systems. Then we'll go on to the various techniques which have been developed for, um, for this purpose. So this is a summary of the techniques which we're going to talk about well, so we're going to talk of some of them today. I won't be able to in an hour to get through all of them. But what we'll do is uh, essentially the list, the colors here represent uh, the, um, the ones which we're going to talk about are in black. Uh, the, the red ones are the ones which received the Nobel Prize in uh, 2014. And the, there are some others which in blue, which we will not... Uh, we'll, we'll not discuss um, at all, but they're still there and you can look at them. The references are listed at the end of the talk. So we'll go through these various techniques. First of all, we'll talk about the Abbas theory, what his limitations showed us, and, and then we'll go to the, through the various types of technique which has been developed for uh, improving the resolution. Now, just to understand, you will understand what the numbers mean here. It says at the bottom, the numbers in brackets, which we'll call N, is, uh, just tells you how much better than the ABBA limit you, uh, for incoherent light. This is the definition. Incoherent light will be one. With the same optics, how much better can you do by these various techniques? And, um, I will go through these various things. There were two, two short bits of theory which I'll push in, in uh, on the way. One of them uh, refers to an old theory, the older theories of uh, space bandwidth products and a, a discussion of the efficiency of light usage, which is inherent to, super, super resolu to optical super resolution. So um, let's go to the next page. Um, so the first of all, we'll start with the classical resolution limits, by um, which were 
they defined by, by Rayleigh and ABBA. The telescope, the telescope one, which actually was later, I was surprised to see that it came after the ABBA lid, sorry, uh, after the ABBA lid, was for a telescope, which everybody knows about from their undergraduate days, the Rayleigh limit of 1.22 lambda over D, and the one which is closer to the uh, to, to what you could actually see. This is the theoretical one, which is very convenient, but the sparrow limit is closer to the real vision, which is 0.95 lambda over D. If for coherent illumination, the telescope is not defined. And um, we'll see, in fact, just a few words about that later on. Then the ABBA limit from 1873 for a microscope, ABBA showed that the, the, um, the coherent limit was lambda over the numerical aperture and the coherent limit, which is the one which is of most importance because most microscopy is done with incoherent light, was for was lambda over divided by twice the numerical aperture. Now, the importance of coherent and incoherent light in the microscope, uh, just a word about that, coherent light First of all, as you see, it gives you less resolution, which is a little surprising. You would think coherent light would be better, but it isn't. Um, in the incoherent uh, light, doesn't uh, provide, it doesn't give you as much background noise as coherent light does. Coherent light gets reflected off the lens elements and the tubes and so on, and then interferes with the light in your image, and that's a very uh, that's a nuisance whereas the incoherent light doesn't interfere. So it may give you a little bit of background, but it's much, le much less troublesome because it's more uniform than the case of the coherent. So incoherent light is ideal for, uh, for, for microscopy, and that's what we're going to talk about. So the ABBA limit was, he, uh, ABBA showed this for the case of uh, micros uh, microscopy imaging of a um, of a uh, diffraction grating. Just a word about the Rayleigh and Sparrow resolution. Uh, the Rayleigh resolution, as we said, one point two two lambda over the refract over the uh, lambda over the, divided by the diameter of the telescope lens. You see, this is two. Here we have two uh, um, incoherent stars imaged as I say by a telescope, and you can see they're very well separated. You can easily see they're separated. Uh, in the case of coherent light, if there were such thing as coherent stars, then they would not be separated at all. Uh, on the other hand, if the coherent light, if you had two stars, you could actually arrange them to be in antiphase, which is a possibility, a theoretical possibility, not a practical one. You can see they're very well separated, but unfortunately all that does is tell you the two stars. It doesn't tell you anything about the separation between them. Uh, then if you use the incoherent sparrow resolution, which is, a, uh, you can see that in the case of um, two stars which are separated by the sparrow limit, you can, you can tell it's two because of the shape, but you can't see that minimum in the middle. And that's essentially the point about the sparrow resolution, that um, the, two, the, 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 the light in distribution does not have a dip in the middle of it. That's how it's defined. So anyhow, these are just in the case of inco completely incoherent uh, stars with a telescope, not relevant to microscopy, except that the numbers are very similar. Um, then, now, where did the ABBA resolution limit come from? Well, ABBA, as I said, uh, in, uh, he introduced his idea by assuming that he was looking at a diffraction rating with period D and it illuminated it with uh, coherent illumination. And then you would get a series of uh, first coherent illumination. And then you will get a series of diffraction orders, zero, plus one, and minus one, and higher orders. Now, in order to get the image, you have to have an, the image is in fact interference pattern between the first and the zero and the minus first orders. So they all have to pass through the lens. And his criterion was simply that the angle of the first order should be less than or equal to half of the angle of subtended by the lens at the grating. And then you would get the zero and the first and the minus first orders. They would focus in the Fourier plane 
and then they would interfere and give you an image with the magnification, which is simply the ratio of the optical distances on the two sides. So uh, that's the way you will get an image. If these first orders were missing, then you would get no image because only the zero order light would reach the image plane and you wouldn't get an image. So that tells you that the, for axial coherent illumination, the, um, the limit would be lambda divided by the, the angle, or in fact, the, the wavelength is lambda over the refractive index here. So it's lambda divided by n times the um, sine, sine alpha, and that's, the, uh, that's the, 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 the limiting resolution. So that's what we would get in the case of a microscope. Now you immediately can say, well, why not illumination, illuminate it at uh, the angle of the uh, first or of the minus first order, and then you get twice the angle. Well, this is true, but you'd only get twice the angle in this particular plane. In all the other planes, you would get uh, for the period of the, the, the grating, if it were in other planes, you wouldn't get anything. So, because you'd miss the first order. So, in fact, that would theoretically be a good idea, but in practice, it wouldn't work except for a grating in this angle. Now, if you go to incoherent, like, uh, incoherent light, then that is exactly what you do. You say, well, incoherent light is the superposition of uh, illumination at all angles, all angles that go through your condenser lens, and you make sure the condenser lens is, is stronger than the um, imaging lens you may you if you you can then put uh, in, in coherent illumination at every angle including the angles of alpha and minus alpha and therefore your zero for the element which is at this angle you get zero as uh, zero order here first order here and that's and and that gives you an image the gives you an image that image is actually a coherent image because it's produced only by the incoherent uh, uh, component in this direction but you have all the different angles they can be incoherent between them and so in the end you get a good in good resolved image when the angle uh, when you have um, the period is equal to twice lambda divided by twice sine alpha times n, which is lambda divided by twice the numerical aperture. Well, as I said at the beginning, this limit um, lasted for 100 years. And um, this, is, this is just said what it is again, just to remind you what the point spread function is. The point spread function of an ideal is the image of an ideal point object. And we'll need that a lot of time during this talk. So, uh, just remember that's the point spread function. You know, this point spread function, the ideal object, the delta function, contains all of the spatial frequencies. But of course, it's limited by the optics to the spatial frequencies up to uh, about uh, one over the um, the, the, the the resolution limit. So that um, so the point spread function is not a point, not an ideal point, it's a spot. And that we're going to use this idea a lot in the continuation. So um, this is just the memorial at Jena University for Ernst Aber, one of the memorials which has an equation on it. Here's the, the uh, equation which we have just seen. And that if you visit Jena, you can go and visit this. So the, um, now to show how important how basic this resolution limit is, um, you can interpret it in terms of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for a single photon. Well, I want to do that because this gives us a hint of how to go, how to get on with the uh, super resolution. So um, we say that the, if the, we have a lens of a certain aperture here, then the a photon can go through an object a photon which is dif is diffracted by the object can go in and, and reaches the image can be going at any angle between this and this between the two extreme angles here so you can say that we know that we know that delta p its, it's momentum the difference in momentum is between this vector px and p minus x going in this direction so delta p and 
the momentum of the photon itself is P, which is, direct, uh, is drawn by this line here. And so we have delta P over P is twice the uh, tw twice sine alpha. Now the, the ratio between this, the diameter of the lens and the, and the uh, vector between the object and the edge of the lens, which is of length P, gives you twice sine alpha. And then we use the relationship, the Borelli relationship, that P is equal to H divided by the wavelength. Wavelength in this case is lambda divided by the refractive index of the medium here, so it's H divided by lambda over N. And therefore, and so now, um, and then we have the uncertainty relationship, delta Px times delta x is greater than h. So we put these together, delta Px is equal to 2p sine alpha, we put p is equal to h divided by lambda over n, and we get in the end that delta x is lambda over 2n sine alpha, which is just uh, Abba's criterion, lambda divided by two twice the numerical aperture. So it seems that the Abba criterion is supported by the by is supported by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and that's one of the basic uh, tenets of quantum theory so how are we going to get around it is it possible to get around it well there's one thing that we missed out here I wrote it up here I didn't mention it in particular but it's for a single photon and therefore if we try to to if we try to make it um, 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 if we try to, to extend it for many photons, then we'll get the following. That delta before, if they have del n uncorrelated photons, uncorrelated, then delta p is equal to twice the square root of n, because that's the, the um, sum of a random collection of uh, different angles, of photons with delta p's in, at different angles. So delta P is twice root N times P sine alpha. And therefore we get in as a result, delta X is lambda divided by twice the numerical aperture, divided by the root N. And that gives us a hint of how we can get better resolution. We, go, we must use more photons. And in fact, if we, according to this equation, enough photons can achieve any degree of super resolution. If you make N into the sixth, then you're going to get a thousandth of the, 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 ABBA, um, of the ABBA criterion, which is wonderful. Well, of course, things are a bit difficult to do, to do that, but just the same. It tells you that quantum theory really doesn't um, object to our getting super resolution. Now, if that's if the photons are not correlated, and then the, the, the sum of their momenta is going to be root n times delta p, um, if the photons are correlated, you can do even better than that. And here's one of the references from David Mendelovich and Dave Zalewski and uh, other people which uh, talks about that. Incidentally, the references which I will mention here are all together at the, uh, in the last slide of the talk. And I have given the organizers a PDF of the whole talk, which you are welcome to use welcome to receive and you have all the references there so um, so that's where we've got now essentially these as I said the factor of root n is the basis of all the new forms of incoherent super resolution by observing a point image n times its exact center position can be estimated with sub pixel resolution, which is root n times more accurate. Here's your point spread function. Here are your pixels. You can see if you take one photo, if you just took one photon and said, well, it's here, then that would give you essentially a, uh, a resolution limit of two pixels. On the other hand, if you do it a thousand times, sometimes it's here, sometimes, sometimes here, sometimes here, occasionally it will be out here you put all these together, then you will get a much better accurate uh, estimate of where the center is. And that's essentially what we want to do. That's provided, of course, we know what the point spread function looks like. And that's one of the things which we'll get to as we continue. So, um, and in fact, if you, you look at this from a mathematical point of view, this is a process of deconvolution, provided we don't have overlap 
between the points which we're looking at, we can use deconvolution to, uh, to, to get a super resolution using many photons. We, do, we take the many photons, we, take the def we deconvolve it according to the, the um, point spread function, which we can calculate for the system, and then we will uh, get, a, uh, get a better resolved um, image. Now this, this works beside, provided that the objects, that the points, point sources don't overlap. And that's the problem. This is called a sparse object, which is mainly dark. And so it works very well in astronomy because stars tend to be well separated. At least the ones we can see are still separated. Uh, Donahue in 1992 shows, uh, shows that the, the condition for deconvolution is the average separation of bright points has to be greater than twice the extent of the PSF. And um, this has been developed quite significantly for astronomy by Wiener as early as 1935 and the process of Hergborn in 1974, which is widely used in astronomy. So that's the telescopic side of it. Now let's get to, to microscopy. Um, the microscopy can be divided up in, as I showed in the very first slide, into several types of uh, super resolution. The first one we'll talk about, uh, which is important because it doesn't require modifying samples. So the, the ones which got the Nobel Prize in 2014 involve modifying the sample, and that's the disadvantage which they have, which I hope that will be got over in a significant way in the, in the future. But um, so they were modified by making them fluorescent, fluores fluorescent, fluores fluorescent, with f fluorescent, with um, with uh, di fluorescent dyes, um, which uh, modify the sample. If you with something which is living is probably killed by them, but um, and so there is a important point in trying to do to. Uh, super resolution without modifying the sample, without any touching the sample at all. And one of the ways of the way, uh, is by doctoring the point spread function. If we can doctor the point spread function, we can make it as small, small as possible, then we can use it as a scanning mechanism to get very better, um, to get a better resolution. And the first attempt at this, a very old one by Toraldo di Francia in 1952, Use phase, phase apodization. Uh, this was a theoretical idea until about the 1980s. Um, uh, it was just on, on paper. But it, that will give you a, a, re, a resolution improvement of between two and three. The price that we pay, there's always a price for the super resolution. One price here is the field of view. It works for a very small field, field of view. And the second was that it uses very, very few of the available photons. Most of the light is wasted. Um, and for that reason, it was essentially untouched until about nearly two, uh, about 1990, approximately, when the first experiments were done uh, on that. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit because the ex experiments were done by my group and Sorry, I have to advertise a little bit of what I've done. Most of this work today is not done by, uh, by me. So let's just look at the aperture phase. What we have, if we have a full aperture, then the point spread function looks like this. This is a simply calculation. If we take a ring aperture around the edge, we can get slightly better resolution. It's a, um, a zero order jet Bessel function instead of a first order Bessel function, and you get a very small improvement in the resolution. And this is in fact the best you can do um, with a simple uh, aperture. You can see that it wastes light. Most of the light going through the center of the aperture is not used. So this immediately shows you the price is in the degree of um, light usage. What Toraldo di Francia showed was that you could do a better job if you use a series of rings with alternating phases, positive, negative, positive, negative, and you could devise a set of rings which gives you a center spot as small as you like. You could really get as small as you like. And this is an example 
of, uh, of a system with four rings. You can see there's a very small center spot here, but unfortunately, there's a lot of light gets into the field outside. And so if your image is bigger than this region of black around here, then you, can, uh, you, you really can't uh, use it very well. What we did in our experiments, which I'll show you in the next slide, is to do an optical product between this mask, this aperture, and this one. That is, we put a beam splitter and got two, image, two, two optical paths, one of them the full aperture, one of them was this um, um, phase mask aperture, and then we could, uh, if you take the product of this and this, you can see that the product is multiplied by essentially one in the middle and zero in the outlying region, and we got a thing like this, which was much better for getting a larger field of view. And in that case, we will go to, um, and that's what we'll see in the next, this is just, just what we expect to see. This is the, um, uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the um, point spread function for the full aperture. This is for the phase, this is when it's multiplied by the last, the last one. With the, phase, with the phase rings, and you can see there's a strong peak, the two weaker, there's a ring around it, and essentially very little else. And we got super resolution using this. We couldn't do it with round things because we used the you know, microelectronic uh, uh, facility for producing the masks, and they weren't able to do circles very well. So we did it with square ones, but it works just as well. Here you have the, uh, the this is the positive, this is the negative, so it was this minus that, whose, whose diffraction pattern has this peak here, a relatively dark region around it, and strong region outside. And after the multiplication, we got the center peak only, and this gave us indeed super resolution. The apparatus was quite complicated, um, it's done in 2000. This is what the best you could do for two, we had two, uh, two independent lasers, which are an incoherent, relatively incoherent, one compared with the other, and so we were not separated with the full aperture. And then when we put, we used this rather complicated apparatus here, we got very good separation between the two. And so uh, we showed that Toaldo's idea really did work. So, okay, that was, that's a system which you could use, and it does have the advantage of not affecting the sample. The sample uh, is, um, is untouched and, the, and so um, it is useful, but it doesn't give you, as I said, it gives you two to three improvements in the resolution. The second system, which is an older one, confocal scanning microscopy, invented um, uh, in, about, in about 1980, and you can and the point spread function. You here you're modifying the point spread function. The point spread function: the object moves. You have a plane wave focused to a ideal point spread function. Here, this ideal point spread function is re-imaged onto a pinhole, so that if the sample doesn't affect it, all the light goes through the pinhole. But if the sample affects it, then most of the light doesn't go through the pin, pinhole and it becomes darker. So, and then you have to scan the sample in the X and Y, and you can scan in the Z direction, and you will get, uh, this is the comparison, the black curve is the, is the bright field point spread function. The confocal one is slightly better, it's a factor of root two better in, in width, um, short sure, smaller in width that is so you get a better resolution and that's um, the result of this fairly simple apparatus um, containing two Im imaging the points and the, the re-imaging it the great advantage of the fo confocal system which is it's used very significantly um, uh, for a lot of things is that it's very sensitive to the Z position. If you move the um, if you move the object in the Z direction, this works. It gives you light goes through the pinhole only if it has got only the light that has gone through the uh, conjugate plane to the pinhole in the object. If the light has gone through in another plane out here or out here, then it's essentially blocked because it. The light from this area is um, 
from a point in this area is spread out in the pinhole region, therefore very little goes through. So this is very useful as a three-dimensional imaging system. And, um, the, and that's in fact where the, the confocal imaging is very widely used for three-dimensional objects where you can get a good image of, the, of an interior plane. So this is what the uh, point spread function looks like for the confocal microscope. And you have, um, you have the uh, maximum here, which is about 0.3 lambda divided by the numerical aperture, which is smaller than the, a bit smaller than the, um, the, the ABBA limit, but you also get almost, you get twice that value, but this is much better than you get from any other, um, uh, any other three dimensional system in the depth. You get um, your lambda divided by numerical aperture approximately um, and in, in the Z direction. And that is very important and widely used. So that's where we, uh, that's the, was the situation until about uh, 1996 or something like that, um, when Gustav, Mats Gustav, 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 so, um, start, uh, works, uh, 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 published an idea for linear, for stru structured illumination microscopy, which theoretically will give a factor of two. And um, the idea here was to, to illuminate, to affect, you modify not the microscopy system, but the illumination system by making it periodic with a high frequency, the highest possible frequency you can get. And what this does in Fourier space is to shift the information in the image um, from the center to the edges and what's more important, from the edges to the center. So that information which was in the Fourier plane outside the resolution limit is now moved into the center of the uh, of the region of the Fourier plane and therefore contributes to the image. Um, I imagine that Gustafsson would have been included in the in the um, Nobel Prize in 2014, but unfortunately he died in 2011. Um, so for what he uses is incoherent bright field periodic illumination. And you can in fact do better than this limit. The limit of two is for a linear system. If you have a nonlinearity, if the, uh, if the refractive index is a nonlinear function, is a function of the intensity of the light, you can do better than this with the same system. And he in fact showed that you can get a factor of six by using, um, by using a, an inco uh, using, um, using a, a nonlinear system. So the idea of the, uh, the, the idea of, uh, of, um, of Gustafsson's system was this, so let's look at it for just imaging and diffraction grating again. This is, the, uh, this is the image which we're trying to look at, and this is the mask. Now, this image is, has a higher base spatial frequency than the mask does, but if we illuminate this image, this object, should, I sh probably should have put object here rather than image, then you have to get the idea. This mask, if this mask multiplies this, we get worry fringes. And the difference between them is recorded in this very long period, that is very low frequency stuff, which is now moved to the center of the Fourier plane. If you take the in the Fourier transform of this picture here, you'll see that you can easily identify the contribution of this very long period. It's near the center. It's uh, also, if the frequency is slightly less than the mask, you get the same thing. You get this. So how do we distinguish between greater than or less than? If we want to get an image, we have to know exactly what the frequencies are, not just how, how they uh, relate to the mask and the answer is you have to move the mask uh, if you move the mask um, relative to, to the object and this is where the waste of light comes in you have to have several images you move the mask if the worry fringes move in the opposite direction to the uh, your opposite direction to the mask then the image has a higher frequency than the mask if the 
one of the fringes move in the same direction as the mass, then the frequency is, uh, is lower than that of the mask. So by taking, let's say, three images, so you can identify this movement, you know now whether it's this one or this one, which both of them give you, um, for any one position, give you the same period. So that's the general idea behind, um, behind uh, structured illumination imaging. And here just this shows you, see, this is your object which has various frequencies in it. This is the mask, the uh, illumination pattern. You can see the variations in spatial frequency here, which all around the resolution limit are now very close to zero frequency and therefore you can investigate them very carefully and get good resolution around uh, frequencies greater than the resolution limit. And this is the sort of pattern which you get, and you have to uh, work on it mathematically, but that's, uh, that's just mathematics, that's image processing. So that's the way, the way the, um, the structured illumination works. You record the images with different phases, and then, uh, which means translating the illumination grating uh, linearly, you need at least three samples in each direction. Now we talk about something in two dimensions, then we have to move it in different directions. And therefore, um, therefore, we need also to rotate the illumination grating to get the information in different directions. And then we can, in fact, increase the observed uh, Fourier plane by a factor of two. And this just shows you how it works. This is an object. We multiply it by, by the, this periodic um, illumination. So this is the picture, it's, it's Fourier transform this gray thing here. There is the ABBA resolution limit is the circle. This part of the Fourier transform is outside the circle for the single image. But when we convolve it with the three points, the zero, first and minus first order, which are the transform of this periodic grating, then you see you get the periodic, uh, you get the image, the Fourier transform three times. And this little bit of the of the transform, which was inaccessible before, is now within the uh, within the uh, resolution limit, and therefore of the system, and therefore you can see it. So this worked very nicely. Uh, um, this is just how the apparatus was built. Uh, this is the re region of Fourier space, which is is, is sampled in one dimension. If, and this is the mathematics for solving it. Essentially, all I wanted to show here: you have three equations. You have three equations. You have um, uh, you have uh, uh, three simultaneous equations, and you have uh, three three um, you have three three unknowns. And there, and when, you know, the, remember the e the i phi is known because it's related to the movement. And so you have three unknowns three equations and therefore you can work out what is the Fourier transform and uh, out to 4, four k0 and if in drawing it this is in one dimension in three dimensions in two dimensions you have to take the three different directions in order to cover the essentially the whole circle of radius 4k0 here it was 2k0 which is the ABBA limit here you get to 4k0 and we can get it this is uh, this, uh, these are pi pictures from, from Gust Gustafsson's work. Uh, these are the, uh, the seven images shown in the previous slide. He puts them together and here you get the, uh, the full Fourier transform out to, out to 4K0. And this is, gives you images and here are some real images, real things, not just drawings. Bright field image. These are essentially done with um, 50 nanometer uh, glass balls, by the way. Here you can see the bright field image. This is the confocal, which is always used as a sort of um, best, uh, best classical system. Uh, you can see that the images are a little bit, a little bit better with the confocal system. It gives you a factor of 1.4 in resolution. And here is your factor of two resolution, which you can see the, the uh, glass balls quite Quite well, and this is a this is a um, biological implementation of the same thing. Bright field compared with structural illumination. This is the best magnification, where you can see the difference between the two. So that's the system which is 
uh, which works and will um, and as I said has the great advantage of not needing a modification of the sample and you, you, if you use saturated uh, fluorescent imaging but this involves a uh, man uh, um, uh, 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 modifying the sample, then you will find that you can, do, you can get better resolution up to six times the ABBA resolution for, uh, but as I say, this needs higher Fourier components, which means nonlinear system, and it's difficult to do that without fluorescent conditions. Um, but it can be done. So I just want, now you've seen that the uh, what we are doing here is, uh, we said that we waste light. We waste light and we have to see how this improves the resolution. The problem, this problem, problem was attacked by Lukos in 1967, a long time ago. And he said his, uh, I'll just show you, show you this, this is a little bit of mathematics to keep you awake or put you to sleep, whatever. And uh, the imaging system recombines the waves which, uh, which are diffracted by the object into an image. That's what it does. Now, the number of parameters in the image cannot be greater than the number of parameters in the object. So, uh, what, so um, we have to ask, what is the number of parameters in the object and, um, and how we can use that to maybe get more information about the image? Lukos called these parameters degrees of freedom, and he uh, invented the term um, the the space bandwidth product, which is essentially the number of distinguishable periods in a sinusoidal um, image in the field of view. You can say, for example, if you have a field of view of a certain tie, size, and the the, the system has a certain resolution, then you can get zero, one, two, three, up to 17 periods, and then you've reached the, uh, the, point, the, um, reached the resolution limit. You can't put more than 17 periods in the, in the field of view. Now, that means what you actually get is the number of degrees of freedom is, uh, in that case, is 34 plus one. One plus twice the distance times the uh, times the bandwidth, which is 17 in what I just said. Uh, why two times? Because you have two possible phases. It can be sine or cosine, uh, but everything else is a superposition of the two. So you get twice that number, L times B, length times the bandwidth, and you add one for the zero order. And so if you now look in, in four dimensions, X, Y, Z, and time T, you simply get the uh, you get this. Um, uh, you get this product, which is the number of degrees of freedom in the object. The, and every one of them is twice the size, times the, uh, tw uh, times the uh, bandwidth, which is determined by the angles of diffraction, plus one. And you get this product here. Now, in the image, you will get the same same thing, but there will be degrees of freedom in x, y, z, and t in the image and you can now play around with these things the number in the image has to, cannot be late greater than the number in the object you cannot add degrees of freedom but you can make it as close as you as theoretically as close as you can to equal and the you one of the ways which we already discussed is using many photons which simply says that this will be uh, if, if the object um, uh, in, in the object, we have a, something which does not change in time, then the bandwidth in T is zero. I'm sorry, uh, uh, the, in, in the image, we get an image over a long time. That's it. The bandwidth in T is zero. It does not change with time. If we take, uh, now consider the, uh, taking a lot of images, we can take a long time and a high frequency of imaging gets this number very large by taking a large, long time and many images. And then we say we just take the average. We want just one picture because we know the object is not changing. This becomes one. And therefore, we can, at the price, at that price of getting one image out of many, many uh, photons, then we can 
maybe increase one of these three or even more of them and get a higher bandwidth uh, uh, um, space bandwidth product in x y or z or more more than one of them and that means that the means that the number of distinguishable periods in the image will be greater than it was in the object as but we just have to remember that we can never get something for nothing we have to in this case we've made the assumption that um, that the object does not change in time therefore the image we get one image representing the whole time period and the uh, and the essentially the aim of super resolving systems is to use this playing around with the degrees of freedom into in, in order to see what we want so um this is just the example which i just gave you that we can uh, oh there are two two other two examples here one of them is in time we can take um the bandwidth uh, we can we can have a system in which the object does not change in time but we get a lot of images and then we take the average and we can uh, therefore improve the resolution the other one the other uh, another system is supposing we know the object is, is one dimensional it's not two dimensional then we can take a two dimensional image and using the fact that we know that the bandwidth in the object is zero in or in the direction of y let's say we can use we can use that to um, we can use use that to get more in, information about the about the uh, object um, by using that idea this is in fact very it sounds trivial but it is very important this is used very significantly in the micro microelectronics industry inspection of um, it's a microscopic inspection of um, chips during their production uh, to see that everything is going well we know what the object should look like therefore we can the number of degrees of freedom in the uh, in the object is small in let's say the x direction because we know it's a series of stripes by imaging it on a with a large number of elements on the ccd in um, in the y direction and the x direction together we can use the fact that we know that one dimension is a straight line and that's defined and therefore find a lot of information about the other direction and this is used in microelectronics um, the, this is the example of measuring overlay, which is done in the system of KLA, for example. If we know the system looks lo like, like this, we don't need to worry about the degrees of freedom of, um, of the, let's say, the length of this part or the length of this part and so on. What we, um, what we, we, uh, we can concentrate all our information on what is the overlay error. That is, what is the difference or the distance between the edge of one part and the edge of the other part, and find this very accurately. And indeed, this is used very, very significantly in the overlay inspection systems of KLA, where they can reach uh, using simple optical arrangement, they can get a resolution of nanometers, so single nanometers, or even less. I believe they've even made the improvements that is less than a nanometer now to find this distance when all the other things are known. So all you have to do is fit, essentially fit this picture with this as a variable to the picture which is photographed and you are using uh, inter interplaying the different um, degrees of freedom in the image to get this one very very accurate so you know it's just, it's just looking at it from lucas's point of view the thing which seems pretty obvious so now we'll uh, get to the, the recent work and the uh, which received the nobel prize in 2014 using fluorescence microscopy um, this unfortunately as i said requires modification of the object if this is not possible then essentially the, these techniques are uh, not allowed but in but um, very often the fluorescence microscopy is part of the of the microscopic system anyhow because you want to do functional microscopy which means that you want to know not only what things look like but what they're made from and this can be done by attaching 
um, molecules to the object, which join, which attach to certain parts of the object because of, for chemical reasons. And if these these uh, these attachment molecules can be designed uh, as fluorescent molecules, which is means finding the things with the right uh, arrangement of of energy levels, then we can then we have the advantage of being able to do super resolution using the fluorescence and getting the information that we want out of the object, which is what the different materials are at various places on the object. So we may, may be killing two birds with one stone by using fluorescence microscopy on these objects, both the resolution and improving the resolution and improving the accuracy with which we can see what is going on from the chemical point of view. That's why the Nobel Prize was, for chem was given for chemistry in this case. So there are several techniques and the first, what we'll do first is just look at what is fluorescent. Uh, what, what is fluorescent? Uh, uh, what, what is the fluorescent system? The ideal, base, the basic uh, fluorescent molecule has three energy levels, E1, E2 and E3. Now what's, uh, E1 is the ground state, which is, let's say, um, infinite, infinite um, time, because the electron will stay in this level for an infinite time. Uh, E2 is a level which is, can be occupied by an electron, but it for a very short time. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, um, its decay time is very short. That is, the electron goes up to here, but it almost immediately falls out of it. Now, there are two possibilities here. Of course, it can fall back to the ground state, but there is also a better stable state, um, E3, which is lower than E2, and some of the molecules, and there is a, a matrix element which connects these two so that it's possible for the electron to fall into the metastable state. So some of the electrons will fall back to E1, and some of them, hopefully uh, many, a large fraction, will fall into the metastable state E3. Now, when they're in the metastable state, that means that they will stay there for a time before they will fall down to back to E1, um, with spontaneous emission. On the other hand, um, uh, 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 and when they fall down, they emit fluorescent, fl uh, fluorescent emission, and that's the way you could recognize that this particular molecule was, was um, this particular molecule was excited. So uh, that's the way the fluorescent molecules work. They're used generally for chemical reasons. The molecules attach themselves to certain parts of the object and the fluorescent emission comes from those parts of the object which are connected chemically to the, flu uh, to the fluorescent dye. Now in practice it may be a little more complicated but the gen same general idea is excitation to E2. E2 may be one level amongst a uh, multiplet. Um, the, 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 during the fast decay from E2, first thing that happens is the electrons fall down within the multiplet, so they reach this level here, which um, is, uh, is metastable. And then you get fluorescent emission, the light is emitted and it falls down to the multiplet near the, uh, near the ground state. So the fluorescent emission may not be monochromatic, it may have a wider bandwidth depending on which of these levels was uh, the electron fell from and to which one it falls here. But uh, so this may not be very highly coherent in illumination. Um, so, but anyhow, the same general idea. Now later we'll see that there's some more complicated fluorescent systems we used, but this is the basic one. And the STED, STED system, by Helen Wich Wichmann, uh, invented in 1994, gets a super resolution factor of 10 using what is called stimulated emission depleted scanning microscopy, STED. So super stimulated emission depleted scanning. So um, how does this work? Well, the, I'll show you the apparatus. Well, let's have a look at the next slide and then go back to this one. Uh, sorry, there, this is this. Here's your 
here's your microscope. You put into it two, two, um, two pulses, one and two. One is an excitation pulse, one is the stead pulse. The interaction takes place in the object and the fluorescence image uh, it comes out as a different wavelength which is separated by two uh, di dichroic mirrors and comes to a avalanche photodiode and then you have to scan the object. This, this system requires uh, scanning, uh, scanning. So this, these are the, the levels which we're using. Now what we do is first of all we take our uh, excitation pulse focus it as well as we can with the object microscope objective to a point spread function which looks like this green spot. Incidentally green is a shorter wavelength than red. I try to keep this this uh, on this system and uh, this uh, standard in the this convention this talk. Uh, green is the so this is the point spread function the best we can do lambda divided by twice the numerical aperture this is the smallest we can get. We now um, it, we now uh, we cause stimulated emission from this. That is, we go from, um, we, we, we're now here. We now cause the fluorescent emission to occur by, by stimulating it with this wavelength. We actually put in this wavelength to stimulate the emission. So, but we put it in in a form of a, um, of, a, of a ring, not uniformly illuminated across here. This is a longer wavelength, so the point spread function is larger, but we make sure that it has a zero in the center. And the zero in the center, this shape of the donut, is done by passing this wave through a, a spiral wave, wave, wave plate, uh, which, has, which around its center has a, a, phase, a phase thickness, which is which is linearly related to the angle and does one or two or three full, uh, full periods in a circle. And therefore, instead of getting the, uh, this, this would be the uh, first Bessel function. Here we can get a higher Bessel function. Um, sorry, this is, this is J1 R over R. This system with the spiral wave gives you a point spread function, which is J1, without the over something. J1 has a zero in the center. And if it's any higher special function, let's say we have, um, well, well, this is the mathematics of it. The function of the, of the um, phase plate is some function of the radius, which doesn't matter too much, times exponential I m theta. That is the phase changes as we go round by a, whole number of two pi's m is equal to is a is a is a natural number so when we take the fourier transform of this we will get um, we will get this which is uh, this in, uh, this integral of uh, j m of um, of the radius in phase in fourier space times r and what this means is that um, the, with an annu if we have an annulus with m equals 1, then we will get a point spread function times, uh, I get a delta function times um, e to the i theta, and its Fourier transform is j1, is, uh, is j1 times rho a, and that means that the intensity is j1 squared times rho uh, of rho a. Now j1 has a zero at its center, um, like sine. It's essentially like these functions are very similar to sine and cosine functions. j1 has a zero at its center and therefore the intensity of the diffraction pattern is zero at the center. If we had m equals two, it would be j2, which also has a zero at the center. In fact, all the numbers except for j0 have zeros at the center, so you can make n any number you like, and in fact larger m's will in this case give you um, better um, results in the end. But j1 is what is generally used, I think that will give you, and that's what was what we had in the previous slide. This is j1, which has a zero in the center, and light 
um, fairly close to the center around it. So what happens is that this ring causes, causes um, stimulated emission from here, but since it's zero in the center, what is left is a small disk in the center, which has not been emitted, light has not been emitted, so we've reduced the size of the point spread front point spread function. After that, it's scanning microscopy. You work your way through the, um, you work your way through uh, over the sample backwards and forwards and you get an image. This is essentially what the J1 function squared looks like. And um, uh, in fact, the smallest dot in the center is caused by J1. J2 is a bit wider because it's a square, in the, it's a radius squared in the center and in fact you want it to be as small as possible so j1 is the ideal for it and um, you thought that is the phase has to go like e to the i i uh, theta then this is the system as i said and you can see this is a comparison here of the point spread function in three dimensions again this works in three dimensions um in in the depth and the radius on this picture from the original plane of z is the radius and x, x is, is the depth but anyhow um, no i'm sorry no, that's not right z is the depth and x is the radius because here they turned around this is what we see down here and the and you can see that you get a smaller point spread function 97 like nanometers diameter compared with 490 which is a factor of um, uh, a factor of five. Uh, it's, uh, in, uh, this, this point spread function is a factor of five smaller than this one. So you've got, and you also get the same thing in the depth. You get also improve in the uh, improvement of factor of two in the depth as well. So everything is, seems to be good. So this is the Stead system. And I'll now show you some results from it. This is uh, just a picture of uh, um, of some, I don't see exactly what it exactly is, but you can see that this disk here, which is unresolved in the confocal microscope, is resolved into four points in the um, in the stead microscope. And that's uh, these were some of the initial results published. Uh, not, not so initial, no, these are later ones, 2010. This is a better picture which shows us really what the thing looked like. This is your confocal picture. This is the stead system. And you can see that it's picking up the various points at which the, uh, at which the molecules, the fluorescent molecules have attached themselves to this, as this structure. And each one of them is resolved much better than, and this is a 500 micron scale bar. So these here are about, uh, um, something like about 20, 20, 20 microns, 500 microns. Now that's I don't understand. This is 500. These must be much smaller. So uh, I'm not sure what this, this, this is correct now I think about it. Anyhow, you can see that you get much, much higher resolution using the STED system. Um, um, uh, the, the, if we have the possibility of doing more complicated uh, fluorescent, um, fluorescence and photo bleaching with a slightly more complicated molecules, you can do uh, a system which shows you uh, ideally how the, how the improvement with root n, number of photons used, is, uh, works. And what we do in, the, in, the, uh, in, in these systems is we have a two, the, this is the whole in one molecule, but it has two stages in it. Here's the ground state. Here is a short lived state up here. There is a better stable state here. And the first thing we can do is excite the molecule with frequency F0 from the ground state to the better stable state. Now, the better stable state is a very long lived, lived this exists for a very long time, but we can switch molecules out of it by a third frequency, F3, which takes us up to the short-lived state, which immediately dumps them back in the electrons back into the ground state. So we can switch on and off molecules in the metastable state. Now, if they're in the metastable state, we now use the fluorescence 
just like the one we had before. The ex excitation frequency F1 going up to a short-lived state here, from which the R molecules, uh, the molecules, the electrons drop into a better stable state here, and then they fluoresce at F, F uh, at frequency F2. So we can essentially excite them to fluoresce from the better stable state by using F1. Uh, look, the, I don't expect you to follow all the details here in, in detail, but the point is that we can switch on and off the better stable state. And when a molecule is in the better stable state, well then will fluoresce when we apply an excitation frequency of F1. So that's the basic molecule which we're using now. And, and then what, uh, what we do is, uh, uh, is as follows. First, the fluorescent molecules are attached to the object. They're then photoactivated. And then most of them are switched off. You switch off most of them simply by tuning the intensity of the uh, switching off frequency. This one here, the switch off frequency F3. The intensity of that will, is arranged to switch most of them off again. So you just have a few which are excited, are in the better stable state. Now, you now hope that those few don't overlap in the point spread functions. Remember the condition of Donahue, which was mentioned, uh, mentioned this at the beginning, that you can, you can do deconvolution very well, provided that your point spread functions don't overlap. So you hope that most of them will not overlap, maybe one or two will, but most of them will not. And then you can uh, now, having got them into the better stable state, you have a few, a few molecules which are in the better, better stable state, well separated on the object. You can now excite them back to um, we excite them with this system here with F1, and you just go and cycle this many, many times. They fall back to the better stable state. You excite them again, go back, and so you get many many emissions of photons at F2, all of them, and you know that they come from the same molecule. So, every, so we just follow those molecules through. We take lots and lots of pictures. And, um, and, um, and that way we can, um, and, and, and that way we can isolate them by using the fact that we know there are many emissions from exactly the same molecule, which is, essentially a delta function and therefore we improve the resolution by a factor of root n well n is the number of times we uh, we cycle the second stage and so here are some results uh, of the images from here you can see that this is what it looks like in bright field and then this is the palm uh, the palm system which i've just described and you can take a little bit of this and you can divide and so you get very, very high resolution. And you can see here you're getting points which are in the individual points, which are um, uh, fractions of a micron in size. So these are just the, the, the stages in uh, this is storm is another variation of the same, same idea, but it's very similar. And uh, both of these were two, they're sufficiently different. Both of them were included in the in the uh, Nobel Prize, <coughs> and um, they will. Get, this system gives you a super resolution factor of about twenty. So the this is the different stages, and I just put in the the improvement of uh, according to the Lucas theory in terms of space bandwidth product, and this is some examples. Here you see this is the idea. You get this is your molecule in grey. You put on many fluorescent molecules, but you switch off most of them. The ones which are left are the ones which are signed here. And then you interrogate them many, many times so as to find their positions extremely accurately. When you're satisfied with that set, you switch them off get, and go through the cycle again. You, uh, you excite many, switch off most of them. Now it will be a different set. And here you've got two which overlap. Just to point, uh, just to um, show that this can happen. What happens in the processing is, if two overlap, they very often just throw them out, just don't bother 
uh, bother dealing with them because you don't know exactly where these spots are at the moment the two of them are overlapping so better not to use them at all and you just do this many many times and here you have a a, a um, which uh, looking at a small fraction of it oh, this is I'm sorry this is not small but this is the conventional image this is this little bit magnified so you can see uh, you can see what it looks like in the conventional image there and then the storm image is lots of very tiny points and remember that every one of them indicates a point at which the, which the um, fluorescent image uh, the fluorescent dye is attached so that it tells you something about the chemistry too there may be parts of here which are dark consistently dark which shows that the molecules were not attached to those points so this is storm uh, um, um, here this is this is different i, I didn't quite follow the the the, the uh, various things here but this is using different things in parallel so you can see different molecules the green molecules and the, the red molecules the red and green of course are the colors of the of the reconstruction and they may not be the colors of the fluorescent um, fluorescent emission but in any case this is you can do quite a lot with this using several different fluorescent uh, uh, stages at the same time um, Um, so this is the three this is the three dimensional storm stochastic optical resolu uh, resolution microscope so stochastic means that you are getting a small fraction of the fluorescent molecules working at any particular time and you change that says that uh, that selection stochastically until you have enough of the molecules of course here we're using the time degree of freedom uh, an image of this sort may take you 10 minutes to produce. Uh, 10 minutes is a rate of 100 frames per second um, or more. So that you're getting many, many, many um, uh, uh, images. And, uh, and, and so you, know, we are, this, it, you have to be sure that this object is not changing at the time you're imaging. That is, of course, one of the problems. You can't use it for live samples or anything which is moving or changing its chemistry as time goes on because the different images will be different stages of the chemistry. So here this is using the three dimensional aspect of it and um, you can see the resolution is much much better than uh, the half micron which you would get optically. So uh, those are the techniques which received the Nobel Prize. I just fill in with some other techniques which were developed earlier. They all have the advantages and disadvantages. Near field microscopy. Um, near field microscopy, we all know about atomic force microscope and the, and the um, um, atomic force and the near field uh, I've forgotten the, the, the electronic uh, near field microscope, anyhow. And uh, what we have uh, here is uh, it can be looked at as a form of structured illumination, where instead of using a periodic illumination, we're using a point of in, in one point and then we scan it across the subject. So we first of all have to produce a very small point and then we scan it. And, and then we are already there at the super resolution system, the the, the point of light produced has a size of much less than the, the wavelength. This means you have to put a lot of light in in order to get a little bit out. This is where the waste of light goes, it goes through and you can get down to about a factor of, what is a factor of five at least here. The waves coming out of that, that uh, point source, sub micron point source, are waves which are, are, are mainly evanescent waves so they don't travel very far and this is the disadvantage of the uh, of this near speed near fields um, scanning optical microscope is that it's the waves are very short in distance the uh, if you look at a value of k which is greater than than the two pi uh, two pi over the wavelength then you this uh, then the z propagation 
is has no i in it so it's not a wave like propagation it's exponential propagation minus z times this and so the uh, the penetration is very small it's mainly used for surface investigations where you can put the so the arrangement is like this uh, the developer of the system was Aaron Lewis who's now at the Hebrew University while he was at Cornell University in, um, here in 1984 a long time ago this is your uh, you have a laser extruded fiber which which is it's a fiber or optical fiber way who uh, transmits the way the, the wavelength the laser wavelength at the end this is extruded so that the core of the fiber is very very small much less than wavelength and also the also the cladding is much less than the wavelength too but so that or at least it's all of the wavelength so that you get a very small point of light produced by the the stretching out of the core but of course most of the light going into a cone, cone is reflected back again very little of it comes out and then the propagating waves which are uh, starting from a source which is which is much less than one wavelength in size they don't propagate laterally as in a wave form but as a exponential form and you lose the light very quickly as you uh, as you go uh, to the sample so the distance to the sample must be very small and that's the they say the great disadvantage of the system the, you almost have to touch the um to touch the microscope uh, the um uh, you almost have to touch the end of the uh, fiber to the sample which means a lot of very very delicate control um, this is the same as the scanning tunnel electron microscope, which is uh, uses the same principle with electron tunneling rather than optical tunneling. So it's a set of pictures, um, set of pictures of how the resolution changes with that distance, that distance a, the distance between the end of the of the fiber and the surface of the sample. And you can see when A is much less than five microns, a uh, nanometer, sorry, five nanometers from the sample, you can, uh, this, is, this is one micron. So the lines here are uh, about a 20th of a micron or something like that. And you can see that you get a good resolution when A is less than five nanometers. But there's the A, here's 10, uh, 10, 25, 100, 400. Oh, this is less than five. This is five, 10, um, 25, 100, and 400 nanometers. At 400 nanometers, which is less than half a micron away, you essentially get no resolution uh, at all with this. So it's a good resolution, but the, uh, it has to be only from the from surface or surface information. In addition, this is a scanning microscope, which means that every pixel is is uh, sampled sequentially one after the other so it takes you quite a long time to get this image so uh, the last system which i will mention is called the hyperlens this is a rather clever idea which it goes in a slightly different direction i it was published in 2007 something like that until up to 2012 i haven't seen very much about it recently so maybe it's not very successful but just the same uh, i want to mention it you produce a material you have to produce a special uh, nano material which it consists of layers parallel layers of material which we, uh, of two materials one of them has a real um a real dioptric constant and the other has an ima mainly imaginary dioptric constant the this is usually what is used is aluminium and dioxide and silver silver has very has, has a real um i hope i got those numbers the right way around anyhow it has an imaginary dioptric constant and um and, and aluminium oxide has a real, real one. So 
Um, so, so we get a wave equation which looks like this. And then any value of kx leads to real kz. This is the point because of this minus in the middle here. This minus comes from the i squared, which is because of this epsilon, which is, you know, the, usually the, the wave equation is k, kz squared over epsilon 1 plus kx squared over epsilon 2 is equal to k, k0 squared. Now, if one of the well, if one of the epsilons is i times something, then this turns this into a minus, which means that any value of kx will give you a value of kz. This is the important thing here. That, or the other way around, if you, it doesn't matter what distance you go in, it's wave propagation in one direction, and you get wave propagation in the other direction as well, even for, for values which are past the res standard resolution limit. And if I draw, do this as a drawing, this is what your material looks like. Now, the two, um, the, two there are two refracted, two, two, um, epsilon, the two epsilons for this material depend on the polarization. If the polarization is normal to the layers, then as we know, in the normal to the layers, it's D, which is continuous at the interfaces, and therefore you get the, uh, you get one of the refractive indices. If you go the other direction here, then we get the, uh, if the field E is parallel to the layers, then it's E which is continuous, going one to the other. This is D, this is E. Now, the, uh, is, this is where the difference in the, in the effective, um, um, in the effective, uh, uh, diff um, a, a, dielectric constants comes from because one of them the mean if dielectric constant comes out as e epsilon to the minus one is equal to the mean of the one over the epsilon to the two this is for the um for this is for the longitudinal case and if um and then the epsilon the the transverse uh, dielectric constant is is the mean of epsilon one and epsilon two, not their inverses, and this gives you epsilon t is less greater than zero, epsilon l is less than zero, and then you have, as I said, you get this um, you get this equation which is propagating waves for any wavelength, propagate for any frequency. So when we look at this in terms of the optical, uh, uh, the dielectric, the dielectric tensor. Um, indicatrix. This is the uh, dielectric tensor, which is usually ellipsoid, but you see in this case, this is the minus, it turns it into a hyperboloid, and therefore it's not limited in size. And what is essentially important here is that uh, if I look at the refractive index surface, that is refractive, two refractive indices, NO and NE, for different uh, directions of propagation, you can see that you will get propagation to N, E, and N, O exist in every direction. And there is one particular direction where the wave propagation is tangential to the, uh, to the hyper hyperboloid. This you see, this is a hyperboloid and not an ellipsoid as in usual materials. Then you get a, an infinite refractive index. This is, the, this is the refractive index. If I, uh, if I, go to the direction of the here, which is essentially parallel to this part, then I get an extremely large refractive index, and then the refractive index diverges on the hyperbol hyperboloidal branch uh, along its asymptotes, and therefore, as a result, I can get the, the, um, the uh, what's it called, the um, numerical aperture, which is n times sine alpha, n goes off to infinity, which means the refraction, the diffraction limit is lambda divided by infinity, which is zero. That's the theoretical idea. And they managed to uh, put this in practice by making a system like this with aluminium, a silver and aluminium oxide layers. And uh, object was here. And then the, uh, this is an immersion fluid. But the important thing is that the waves propagating in this region here are, are as if they're an infinite refractive index and therefore 
at a finite angle, infinite refractive index, and therefore we're getting um, we, the object is essentially immersed in, the, in a material with infinite refractive index for certain directions of kz and take advantage of that to get essentially infinite, um, uh, get an infinite resolution limit. So as you say, this uh, was published in about 2007 and 2012. I haven't seen a lot on it since that period. These are some of the pictures which were, which were, uh, um, which were produced, which show the the, um, the two lines and uh, two lines which uh, separated. You see in this in this form, and you can see the the hyperlens uh, images produced. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that this system is going to be very useful for. Uh, biological samples, but anyhow, at least the point is that it does work and we understand why it works. So I've really reached the end of what I wanted to show you with the uh, with the um, experimental stuff. I just wanted to say a few words, and this is only one slide, I think, um, yes, about the efficiency thing. Uh, as I might mention every time, there's very inefficient use of light in these systems. The, the um, uh, the uh, near field system, the light goes through a sub wavelength aperture, which cuts out almost all of the light. Confocal microscope, the, mic the light which is used has to go through a pinhole before the detector. The aperture masking, there is a lot of destructive interference instead, and so on. Most of, we eliminate most of the point spread function by stimulated emission. And in storm, which I didn't write here, uh, you you. Work, you excite most of your your fluorescent probes, but then you eliminate most of them. So in every case, you have wasted a lot of light. And so we ask the question of, is there a basic relationship between the degree of super resolution and the minimal light loss? Now, the answer can be produced using the concept of information entry. I won't go into it here, but anyone who is interested, you could look at the uh, uh, the PDF of this talk. I've added it as an appendix at the end after the, the finish and you can see the details about it which also were published in a paper by uh, published in a paper by David Mendelovich and, and others including me uh, in 2001 and there is actually a paper in the journal Micron which uh, summarizes this question of why is super resolution so inefficient and um, essentially it comes to the idea of information entropy we start with a sample which has a certain degree certain amount of information which is determined by the ABBA, ABBA limit and uh, that the information can be related to a degree of entropy in the system which um, is defined by the information um, by the information specialists and when if you now if you look at the information which you have in the in um, in, in the object as in, in, a, in a classical sense before you choose super resolution then you uh, that's the beginning of what we talked about with Lucas's definition of this space bandwidth uh, product so now we we can say let's switch on the super resolution system and switching it on cannot reduce the entropy you can't reduce the entropy of a system by switching on something uh, like a refrigerator you have to throw away throw away the uh, the entropy is conserved or increased but it cannot be reduced uh, no no practical system can reduce the system the the entropy so we have to see what happens what it means throwing away the end part of the end uh, of um, increasing the entropy for part of the system if we want to reduce it for another part and this could be looked at as an associated random photon loss or scattering which must be involved in the in, in the um, in the process so the result of the, in the appendix simply goes into this in more detail um, that if you've localized a photon, one over n of the dimension of the ABBA, ABBA limit, 
the efficiency of the photon use must be smaller than one over and there's this number here, 6n to the fourth log to the base 2 of n. And this, in fact, agrees pretty well with the experimental evidence for the various techniques. We looked at this, uh, we looked at this uh, comparison, and it's surprising that it is reasonably good. It's just based on the idea of information entropy and saying that the entropy, the total entropy, cannot be reduced by switching on the system. And therefore, uh, if you want to reduce reduce the entropy of part of the system, you have to increase the entropy of the rest of it, which is essentially a loss, a random loss of light. This is detailed in the paper by uh, Bendelovic et al, and also in the paper which I mentioned. So um, I'll summarize what I've said here um, in a few words, and afterwards, uh, just uh, I'll come back to the summary in a moment. Here you have a list of references which were used in the uh, in collecting material for the talk. Um, the subject of why is super resolution so efficient, uh, so inefficient, is is here from 2003. Here's Lukos's paper from 1967, Bendelovich's paper from 2001, the various techniques to Aldo de Francia's work from 1952, and Gustafsson's from around 2000, some of the back, background works from uh, the, uh, both uh, Sh Cox and Shepard work both on the information capacity and also on the, um, on the confocal microscope and so on. And the experiments which I showed you, which we did are here in the middle. So, so the summary of the talk is that I gave an overview of the various ways in which we can beat the ABBA resolution limit. Some of them are work, some of them don't work, some are just synthetical ideas, but all of them waste a lot of light. Uh, the point spread function modification has been imp implemented and gets us down to um, kind of gets us down to about 10 nanometers resolution. Structured light methods um, will um, can, can uh, also do it and uh, can prove uh, if you use uh, well, I just uh, read out what's said here. Worry patterning and sparsity based reconstruction could show uh, to improve the resolution significantly. The new materials, meta -material, new methods with meta materials have been uh, demonstrated, but I don't know how practical they're going to be. But I said a few words about the information theory approach, which shows that the light, the waste of light in in super resolving systems is in, in, in inherent, inevitable. Okay, so thank you very much. And that is the end. Thank you. Dr. Lipson, thank you very much for uh, this very interesting uh, lecture. And uh, for me, um, I think that we will ask you for more, uh, more times, more, more, uh, uh, more, more uh, lectures in the future. Well, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. I hope the, in, the other people enjoyed it as well. Okay. Have you any questions? Um, there is a, in a chat. Uh, no, I don't see uh, questions. Well, if anyone has questions, they can. I've given, the, I've given this long list of references. Most of, I'm sure, most of the answers are there. Um, but uh, if not, then you can contact me, and I hope, I hope I can help. All right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and thank you for listening.